uh, start. I'm very happy that we start this panel uh, uh, on uh, 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 bottlenecks, cracking bottlenecks solutions on the blue economy in the Bay of Bengal, namely uh, Bangladesh, India, and Sri Lanka. Uh, this session is devoted to solutions and to hearing uh, and engaging across, with and across uh, practitioners. Uh, we have today representatives of chambers of commerce, we have economic actors, we have uh, public agencies from the region and from France, uh, at least for the public agency, the, the AFD. Uh, this uh, panel uh, comes uh, in the second workshop in a series of three workshops where we are moving gradually from understanding an issue uh, examining the uh, tools we have in hand collectively and looking at how we can share the tools for data, for analysis, towards uh, trying to see how those tools can serve uh, evolving joint projects or identifying gaps uh, that ought to be addressed in the PPP, public-private uh, partnership manner, which ought to be addressed at the regional level across the countries I've mentioned in the so-called Bay of Bengal, or through international cooperation, and hence the AFD is here. Without going more in the details, I'll uh, just uh, tell you how the thing will be going. We'll have a presentation by an, more than a I mean, word of welcome uh, by Jackie Ampro, who's the director uh, for South Asia, uh, so covering these three countries for AFD uh, on the operational wing. Uh, so uh, We'll have a word of welcome, but Jackie will also uh, express what are the expectations, what are the possibilities, what's the perception by EFD. Uh, he'll give us some accounts of uh, how he sees the process has gone so far, which uh, we'll update all of you as a kind of word of uh, introduction and look, we'll locate you within our exercise. Uh, we'll move on with uh, the similar exercise by uh, some of our uh, 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 colleagues from the region, specialists and practitioners who've already participated in this exercise uh, initially. Then each of them have a few minutes of uh, flagging a few bullet points, giving suggestions, looking at suggestions on how we ought to progress with uh, collectively and with uh, in inter interaction with the EFD, either with Jackie's wing or with uh, Ellen Jufferkit, who's here uh, and whom I thank for supporting our exercise and who's the director of research for the FD sitting in Paris. Uh, and then we'll move on uh, with our program, uh, starting with Aditya Das, Darshani uh, Lahandapura, Mr. Mahmoud Panchali Lapula, Ameya Prabhu, uh, Ms. Shoma Mitra Mukherjee, Mr. Patabi Ramarao, and uh, uh, some words of, of comments by, by other speakers uh, after that. You can see we have a pretty dense panel. The idea is really of a panel, of a round table. Uh, in the interest of exchanges, uh, we I recommend each of you not to have a presentation, but to have a few bullet points to lead, uh, to convey, uh, you know, your pitch. Uh, and my job is to stay as quiet as possible after that, just organize the ping pong across you. It's not a webinar where you have one chance to speak and have to listen to others. It's, it's a round table where your pitch will lead to reactions and you'll be able to react, etc. If we work well, we can easily have uh, two rounds of pitches and reactions for each of you, maybe three. With this, uh, Jackie, you have the floor. Thank you, Joel. Um, can you hear me well? Yeah, all right. Well, thank you, Joel, and thank you to the Bridge Tank for, for organizing this, uh, this discussion with, uh, with economic actors of, of blue economy in the region, with research centers and with AFD. 
uh, we are looking forward to, to, to have this interaction since it's definitely a sector we are interested in. Uh, uh, but before I, I, I move to the main takeaways that as a development banker, we I, I, I have from the, the, the first panel and from the first uh, webinar, I just would like to remind what is a strategic framework AFD is working uh, in. Uh, the first one is the uh, so-called ocean strategy that our board has approved uh, recently with, with three pillars, uh, improve the governance of the maritime areas and resources, promote competitive, sustainable and inclusive ocean sectors, and preserve coastal and maritime ecosystems. That's AFD's vision and AFD's objectives in terms of blue economy, not only in, 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 the, in the Bay of Bengal, but uh, in any countries we, we, we are working on. The second uh, strategic document or frame we, we, we are working in is the French Indo-Pacific strategy. It's, uh, it's a strategy approved by uh, the French government and AFD is contributing to the uh, development component of this strategy, which has many other components, including defense and uh, security. Well, AFD is not involved in that, but the, the, the development component is, is an important part of it. And AFD is one of the major contributors. And blue economy is one of the sectors identified as an opportunity to develop regional cooperation in Indo-Pacific. So those two strategic frames are really uh, uh, our overall uh, strategic environment that uh, we are trying to uh, uh, to stick with when we uh, finance operations. So now if I uh, try to summarize the main takeaways that um, I uh, have identified from last panel and the last webinar, I have four. The first one, and we have uh, widely discussed it uh, during the, the first panel, is the need for more research and more data on fishery resources. Uh, we, 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 uh, the, the different speakers uh, uh, during the first panel uh, told us all uh, about uh, what already exists, but also the challenges with, uh, with the data which are existing and sometimes a lack of accuracy, the lack of tools, the lack of equipment, uh, and the importance of, of the data for um, policy design and also for, for, to, to promote sustainable management of, uh, of um, uh, marine resources. And uh, as Akshita, uh, our colleagues from Delhi uh, mentioned, AFD is, is willing to, to work more on that uh, aspect. Second takeaway um, is um, uh, kind of a lack of information and coordination at country level and or probably some issues of institutional capacity. Uh, legal frameworks and, and national plans for blue economy do exist in most countries of the, of the region and in particular in India and Bangladesh. Uh, but uh, sometimes we feel like uh, they are not uh, really implemented, especially when we are discussing with, with stakeholders uh, who are not necessarily aware of, of them, which makes it a little bit complicated for a financial partner like, like like AFD to reconcile the national strategies which are promoted by the central government and the, the, the local interest. And that's one topic we would be interested in, in listening to, to the experts' views on how to build the institutional capacities of the sector to, to promote this reconciliation between national strategies and, and local interest. Third takeaway is uh, some sort of uh, lack of regional coordination and, and, and vision. We, we can see that there is a great deal of expertise uh, uh, available in, at country level. We have many research centers, many experts who have a, a, a very extensive knowledge of, of the sector, but we don't see any uh, regional uh, vision of the sector. No, no one is really um, developing such, such regional vision and such regional uh, strategy. Uh, most of the challenges are not country specific, uh, even though some of them are really specific to some countries. But I mean, obviously, the, the Bay of Bengal is, is shared. So uh, we, we have some uh, regional uh, approaches which are uh, uh, necessary. 
And uh, AFD is very much interested in working on that regional dimension uh, as part of our contribution to the, to the French Indo-Pacific strategy. That's also one topic we would love to hear the, the, the expert during this, uh, this round table on how AFD as, as a financial partner can support a regional approach of blue economy in the Bay of Bengal and where should we start and uh, who would be the right partner to, 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 to work on it. Last, uh, last takeaway is uh, finding the, the right combination in terms of in the investment. During the first webinar, Dr. Uh, Arnad Das concluded his speech with uh, uh, saying that it's quite important to find the right combination between a nature-based solution and technology-based solution. And AFD cannot agree more on that. I would also add the right combination between investment in infrastructure, which is usually what AFD does, and also social investment to enhance livelihood, like food security, job access, climate change adaptation, since we think that both are very much connected. And, and finding the right balance, it's quite a challenge. And uh, again, we'd love to hear the views uh, of the panelists on, on this. Back to you, Joel. Sorry, I might have been a little bit long. No, no, you've been uh, you've been uh, perfect. Uh, that I, I hope that that gives a useful uh, 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 feedback and way to locate to uh, to all the to all the participants. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, some of the aspects which were related uh, to data, to the need to coordinate uh, those aspects. Let me just flag one brief thing and then hand, uh, hand over the, the, the mic. Uh, one brief thing, as I said, data is used uh, at the same time by, uh, by the authorities, by governments. It's used by business. And sometimes it, it's been used by the business much before it was used by, by the government. Uh, and it's of essence, uh, I'm speaking under control of business people here, uh, it's of essence for the business to use this data to show and demonstrate uh, that they have a sustainable business. This will be increasingly important as data will be uh, used for, uh, for finance, for funding. Uh, and uh, the sounder the data, the more source the data, the more accurate the data, uh, the better the funding uh, will come. Not only from public funds, but also in a process where uh, ESR is developing uh, 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 most of investors are now focusing for uh, directing their investment to uh, reliable businesses, uh, sustainable businesses and businesses that uh, respect uh, the, the, the resources. Uh, maybe on those uh, issues, um, Saurabh Thakur, uh, Chime Yodan, who've been our uh, uh, experts uh, associated to the process uh, want to briefly react launch the conversation give the background and then we'll move to uh, we'll move to uh, the more uh, business and government discussion on those aspects but to to end up with the so-called science uh, aspect of it so Rab, you want to have a word yeah uh, thank you joel so I, I think uh, the previous speaker gave a pretty nice overview of what uh, the discussion so far, the, the direction that it has taken. I'll just add a couple of points to that. And I feel that might just give the context to the conversation in this session as well. Uh, one, this idea of blue economy as a connecting uh, element in the, re in the Bay of Bengal region, that, that in itself, uh, the re a region, a development of a regional blue economy strategy. Uh, that is one potential that can overcome a lot of differences that exist in this region among the countries. And blue economy has that potential. Uh, the other one uh, takeaway for me personally, uh, uh, whether it was the first workshop and the first session today as well, uh, was this idea of understanding the top-down and bottom-up currents of how blue economy is going to be implemented. Uh, in a federal structure like uh, in, in, as it exists in India, uh, we have to understand how blue, blue economy is being formalized at the national level, but how it gets translated uh, at the very bottom level, uh, that remains a challenge uh, as of now. So the first session, to an extent, answered some of these quest uh, questions in terms of the tools that we can have 
uh, in addressing some of the challenges related to blue economy. Uh, I think one area which continues to be, uh, I think, needs a little more enunciation at this point would be how, what sort of an impact, transition, transitional impact will blue economy or the policies of blue economy uh, have on the larger populations in this region, uh, who are not only dependent for their food security and uh, cultural uh, and other linkages with the ocean, uh, but a transition, as we are calling it, a, a massive transition in how blue economy is going to be implemented, will have a, com a new, a, a very different impact on their lives. So that uh, I think that bottom up aspect of blue economy is something that can uh, we can take forward in this session as well. Uh, I think uh, that's uh, about it from my side, Joel. Uh, and I hope, uh, and I'm looking forward to a very fruitful discussion in this session. Thank you so much, Saurabh. And thank you for launching this, uh, you know, kind of bullet point uh, flagging issues, uh, kind of pitch uh, and discussion uh, uh, type. Uh, I, 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 I remind everyone that you're from the Nar uh, National Maritime Foundation. Uh, Chime Yodon is your your colleague. Chime, you want to add a, a few things? Yes, yes. Have the you. floor. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Sora, for uh, giving the um, brief background of the um, discussion uh, that we had so far. And I wanted to uh, point out this uh, one aspect of the discussion. Uh, all the panelists have uh, talked about the data collection. So I wanted to uh, discuss about the data collection methodology, which I think is uh, important um, to point out because the uh, lack of uh, transparency and accuracy and utility, uh, which leads to a, man a manipulation or a misrepresentation of data, which could again lead to uh, maladaptation to climate change, which uh, I think is very important to discuss uh, while doing our research, I myself face uh, such kind of uh, difficulty in interpretation of data. Because um, uh, this one example, uh, if I may uh, discuss it with you all, um, I have uh, kind of an assess the um, mangrove uh, status of um, mangrove uh, forest cover in India, its status uh, over the years. And it shows the increase in mangrove forest cover in India, which um, uh, and despite of the many studies which shows otherwise. Uh, so in such case, I think we should uh, talk about the transparency of data uh, and accuracy of it. And also this other aspect, which is also important, uh, regional climate modeling uh, in uh, so far, um, in India, uh, for example, there's lack of regional climate modeling, a projection of uh, climate projections so far. So that uh, don't, uh, we have to depend on the downscaling data. So that is also one aspect that we can talk about in uh, terms of uh, more research and also funding. And also regional cooperation is something that we can discuss when it comes to blue economy. That are the few uh, points I want to highlight. Thank you. Thank you, Chime. Uh, very useful. As researchers, we always want to know how useful our research or uh, data we develop is to, to the actors. Now we have a chance to engage into that and to many other things, uh, because again, uh, the uh, objective of today's session has been uh, flagged already by, uh, by, by, by Jackie, uh, uh, but the idea is to have a closed door conversation on where we are all going, what's our uh, degree of uh, understanding of the challenges and how we can collectively contribute to have this blue economy not be just a question, an issue of debate, but a, a matter of action, uh, of livelihood for people, of value chain uh, for companies and of uh, stable governance for, for, for authorities. Uh, on those topics, we'll have a first round of, of, of three uh, presentations slash pitches, as I said. Uh, Aditya Dash, who's the vice chairman of the Marine, Pro Marine sorry, Products Export Development Authority uh, in India. Aditya, uh, when I read your title, I see authority. So with my uh, French lens, uh, it means public sector to me, but you've been introduced by Ameya Prabhu, who will speak later as, as a businessman. You'll explain to us how an authority in India is active into the, the development of the value chain. 
Ms. Darshani uh, Lahandapura is the chairperson of the Marine Environment Protection Authority, the MEPA, again an authority from Sri Lanka. And we'll complete this first round uh, browsing through uh, countries of the Bay of, Bay of Bengal uh, after, Shri, after India, after Sri Lanka. We'll complete it with Bangladesh with Mr. Kairul Majid Mahmoud, uh, who's the director of the Dhaka Chamber of Commerce of Industry. And uh, we're very happy to welcome the, the three of you. Let's have our first round of three uh, presentation or flagging points and pitches of your, your various views. Uh, Aditya Dash, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, thank you, Joel. And uh, once again, thank you, Amaya, for the great introduction. So let me just introduce my, myself. I'm uh, Aditya Dash, and I'm in the seafood industry for the last 15 years. Uh, that's my role in the private sector capacity. However, for this term, I am vice chairman of uh, MPDEM, which is the Marine Product Export Development Authority. So it's a temporary government job. I was in the council also, and every year, uh, every three years, they choose, they, they take someone from the private sector and they become uh, the vice chairman. But as far as this talk is concerned, I'm speaking on an official capacity, but every now and then I might switch back and forth from a private sector to public sector. So let, let me just uh, share the screen and, you know, a new, a short presentation I have. I'll keep it very short. You know, and Joel, you had also mentioned it. So going through all the, you know, emails, I figured the, the main topic is what are, what are the implementation bottlenecks? Well, the first thing we need to realize is we have multiple stakeholders. In fact, uh, MPDA, we are celebrating our 50 years of existence. And uh, the, the chairman, he you know, expressed a very good uh, point of view. He said, we should no longer be MPEDA, we should become MPDA. You know, just remove the promotion, uh, the export part about it. It should be Marine Products Development Authority. Because if you just look at the seafood value chain, these are the amount of multiple stakeholders I've uh, listed. MPDA, the EIA and EIC, which is Export Inspection Agency, Export Inspection Council. These are both central government. They come under the uh, Commerce Ministry. Then you have the CAA, Coastal Aquaculture Authority. They technically come under Ministry of Agriculture. Then you have the State Fisheries Department. You have the Central Fisheries Department. You know, then you have the governments of uh, importing countries, like in uh, for the European Union market, will be DG Sante. Will be uh, FDA, FDA for the U.S. markets. You know, then you have civil society organizations, uh, NGOs. Then you have the private industry. So whenever we talk about, you know, whether it's blue economy or, or you know, holistically improve the value chain, we have to get all these stakeholders and more in line. And that obviously is a big challenge. And I'm sure the, you know, discussions like this is definitely a good place to start. But uh, the next step should be implementing something. So that is my solution. So what should be the solution? A pilot project. What I'm proposing is there should be an aquaculture improvement program with one of MPDA's uh, sister organization called NAXA. NAXA stands for National Center for Sustainable Aquaculture. And what we do is we organize group of smallholder shrimp farmers, organize them into farmer welfare societies, and then give them all kinds of inputs needed, whether it's financial assistance, whether it is uh, training, uh, you know, better post-harvest techniques, all that we do, you know, we even set up an e-commerce platform so that uh, they can buy and sell uh, using an e-commerce platform. However, a lot more needs to be done. Interventions are required. Productivity needs to be increased and especially disease management. I mean, we are going through coronavirus right now, but as far as the shrimp aquaculture or any kind of fish farming, I mean, we've had viral epidemics since the 90s. And it's just, you know, going from bad to worse 
you know, uh, year after year. And another important thing I want to mention is whenever we talk about the blue economy, we also need to highlight the impact of climate change, you know, because, and when I'm talking about climate change, since I'm from Orissa, we shouldn't just think about it as if uh, it's only about cyclones. You know, cyclones, yes, in my state, we've done a very good job as far as preventing deaths is concerned. We must take into account that climate change means, you know, that the incidence of these sudden and short bursts of extreme weather events, whether a dry spell, a heat wave, sudden bouts of rains, you know, they have become much more frequent. So a solution that I'm working towards is having solar powered micro weather stations. Because even though we have the Met department, they will give you a very generic forecast and the forecast will be for an entire district. Whereas we need it, you know, if possible to from a 25 kilometer radius. And that can be done, you know, through open source with weather networks, and uh, uh, other solutions are definitely there. Now, why a pilot project? You know, meeting and discussing over, uh, you know, web webinars or uh, e even in physical presence, you know, that is a great thing. But a pilot project is taking that connections to the next level. Once we have a pilot project, like the one, the aquaculture improvement program that I'm suggesting, imagine all the stakeholders in involved they will start interacting with each other. They will make actual human relationships. And that will ensure that in the future, for future projects that we uh, want to implement or future work that needs to be done, this just makes it easier. You know, maybe I'll have contacts with the fisheries department or with my counterparts in Sri Lanka or Bangladesh. And, you know, once that relationship is established, we can keep taking it forward. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dash, for this for this presentation. While listening to you, I was, uh, but I'll tell you, I, I got the answer at the end. I, I, I was wondering, you know, being more ambitious, even you know, sharing your ambition and, and thinking about ambition. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, why a pilot project? Why not something like a large program based on gathering, uh, based on an assessment, map, mapping an assessment of all the pilot projects which have happened uh, uh, in India already in the past. And we, we know it's, it's, it's a vivid laboratory. I understand uh, that what you mean by that is something that would be more international, more regional across uh, across the Bay of Bengal with colleagues from or with organizations from and other authorities from Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, sorry, the, the pitch I have spoken about, it's only for an India specific one, but yes, we can definitely include Bangladesh and Sri Lanka also. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's an, uh, more knowledgeable people than, than you are there. Uh, but, but the Key, one of the key questions we'll have uh, as we look uh, at practice and as, as projects is to do the right fine tuning between two things. First, mm -hmm. the right ma magnitude of, of scaling up and, and of ambition, moving away. Uh, the virtue of a pilot project is known for establishing the links which you've developed and a pilot project in an environment where uh, institutions have still to get acquainted to each other is very useful. Now in an environment, so this could pertain to uh, the uh, regional level. Now, when the uh, actors know themselves a lot, and we've have we've had that through the uh, presentation of the large array of tools that we have through data, for instance, but not just through data, the la large array of tools that exist within a country, for instance, within India, but the same is within Sri Lanka. Or, within uh, Bangladesh. In that matter, uh, and I think it's a, it's a question dear to uh, the AFD, uh, I don't want to speak for them, so I'm speaking under their control, but the right amount of moving ahead, even of a pilot project, and to see how to scale up a program is of essence. So with these questions, which I'm deriving from your proposals for, for which I thank you. Let, let, let's move to, to the next uh, two speakers. We'll also have a comment on those points and others by uh, 
Commander Arnab Das, who's joined us again. Uh, good to see you, Arnab. Uh, and, and I suggest this could be a uh, one way to start flagging the, the conversation. So thank you, Aditya, for, for your presentation. Uh, let me handle the floor to uh, Mrs. Uh, Darshani Lahandapura, who's the chairperson of the Marine Environment Protection Authority, the MEPA in Sri Lanka. So again, an, author an authority. We've observed that in India, uh, we used to have um, people from the public sector going to the private sector at the end of their career. Now it's the reverse. The public sector is picking the brains of the uh, private sector. Uh, Mrs. Lahandapura, can you tell us how it happens in Sri Lanka? And uh, uh, please tell us what are the actions of the MEPA, what is its way of functioning, what are the programs you're thinking about? maybe the international collaborations you're having within the region and internationally. Uh, Mrs. Lahandapura, you have the floor now. Thank you, Shah. And I really uh, appreciate your effort uh, to bridging this, uh, getting all of us uh, together to uh, plan out a proper proposal project on blue economy or on the blue. Uh, my presentation uh, is a bit lengthy. I'll, I'll just uh, run off. I'll skip some of the presentations. In Sri Lanka, as you all know, we have eight times larger maritime sector comes out of the landmass. So we have a, a coastal area more than 1,700 kilometers around the country. So it's an ideal opportunity for us as a country to go for blue economy. And this government, current government, actually, they have uh, it has uh, the national policy framework, uh, which starts for of prosperity and spender. There, we have clearly identified sustainable ocean is sorry sustainable ocean resource management for a blue green economy. So, the from the top, the uh, the vision is there, which that is given, and um, when we uh, from MEPA's point of view, as well as uh, from the country's point of view, we think uh, we are actually located in a very strategic location, but then uh, it also provides us many economic opportunities. At the same time, there are many environmental challenges. So basically, uh, we have uh, our national commitment because the, uh, the entire EZ we have declared as a uh, pollution prevention zone. But then, you, as you all know, uh, very uh, very well aware uh, from our country downwards up to Antarctica, there's no uh, hardly any, any landmass. So basically we, uh, we believe as a country that we have a global responsibility to, uh, to protect the environment that which will go beyond our country uh, in, uh, uh, in respect of uh, environment management protection. And we believe that we have to care for voiceless creatures and man manage environmental crime. So we, this is in the background of our blue economy, uh, a concept this so i will uh, these, these are the common things that we uh, sectors that we have identified fisheries and maritime transportation uh, coastal and deep sea minerals and marine based energy uh, similar to any any other part of the world and uh, we very well focus on marine based communication and it so i will not go into detail because that is common to uh, any 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 country any organization are uh, very similar very common. So basically, uh, our strategy is that we want to develop a national strategy, roadmap, uh, policy uh, at the top level. And at the same time, we, without waiting for that to happen, we have launched few projects. So uh, it is a two-way uh, two approach. While we are doing the uh, top level policy strategy roadmap, uh, and we have uh, launched a uh, few projects to uh, reach the, uh, uh, to uh, go for sustain blue economic concepts. So basically um, from MEPA's point of view, MEPA actually either mandated agency to protect, to prevent pollution, to prevent control and eliminate pollution within our coastal and marine environments. So basically that is our mandate. And apart from that, we actually are going to get more, more, uh, of area, so we have actually developed, or rather, we have uh, in the process of uh, amending our act, incorporating marine resource management. With that, only we'll be able to go for a blue economic concepts. Otherwise, we will just a regulatory body, and we will not be able to do anything other than pollution control. So uh, that is in the post process, and we have launched SDG 14 Secretariat, and uh, these uh, basic documentation was done. 
uh, SDG 14 preliminary assessment and then interagency coordination mechanism, all those things actually for the uh, developing the national strategy policy and roadmap. And then uh, we launched MIPA Academy uh, to develop maritime related in employment and professional qualification, and then a national uh, voluntary movement. And we have inc included a national marine water quality management program uh, uh, into our action plan. And we have coral and mangrove restoration. These will actually also uh, enhance our blue economy uh, projects. So what we have in uh, projects that we are uh, discussing at the moment is that we are uh, just uh, just uh, we are actually had two uh, uh, two large uh, maritime casualties maritime disasters so we are actually having discussion with various stakeholders including donor agencies and uh, foreign countries uh, so uh, to get oil spill uh, response equipment enhanced capacity we don't have a maritime uh, mar maritime disaster management center uh, and uh, we are planning to put up an oil, waste oil refinery facility uh, to receive uh, waste oil from the vessels because that is one of the mandated uh, uh, obligation that we are supposed to do uh, as MEPA. And uh, we are planning to develop 14 numbers of uh, bathing sites as blue flag beaches. This is actually, I think, directly under blue uh, economic concept. Uh, so we have selected and we are in the process of uh, doing the uh, rest of the background work for this, uh, plus uh, to identify the uh, suitable potential donor agencies for this. And then uh, uh, oil spill contingency plan that I told you, and uh, we have done the act uh, amendment so that we can go for these uh, additional activities. And then uh, apart from that, we, we have carried out a uh, lot of programs to manage marine litter because we believe pollution uh, is one of the challenges for blue economy. So we have to have many programs to counter marine litter, pro litter issues. Uh, and we have a uh, lot of uh, programs called beach caretaker. Uh, you know, we have developed, we have selected underprivileged community members who are living in the coastal areas and funded by corporate sector, private sector, and get taking that. Uh, likewise, we have many programs. I'm not going to discuss that in detail and these are the proposed activities for blue economy what we want uh, first and foremost is is to do a marine special planning and then to zone our coastal coastal and uh, marine area so that we will not uh, go for ad hoc development projects and then uh, we we have blue carbon project uh, for decarbonizing and then we have selected a fisheries village which has uh, which has many functions, not only the fishery, but then it has the uh, many other uh, associated uh, uh, industries. So we are uh, as a pilot, we are going to develop this uh, fisheries village as a blue green uh, village, fisheries village, and we have selected aquaculture uh, in eastern province of the country, and uh, some areas will be. Uh, 100% conservated for as marine protected areas. So those are, uh, I actually rushed through because of the time constraint. Those are the uh, planned projects that we have. And we have some challenges and uh, some of them are like this. Uh, the, the biggest challenge that we have is the pollution. So we have to have many continuous education uh, to, to all the stakeholders uh, to avoid the pollution or to minimize and in, eliminate it. And then uh, as uh, Mr. Uh, the previous uh, spokesman, uh, the speaker mentioned, uh, we also experience multi-stakeholder fragmented institution in Sri Lanka. There are various institutions now. There is a department for fisheries, ministry for fisheries, and then uh, the marine uh, mammals and the, the turtles are governed by wildlife, another separate entity. And then um, research is done by another entity. Uh, likewise, we have different entities. So that is one of the challenges that we face. And then uh, one of the other challenges is that uh, decision dri driven, uh, data driven decision making, that is a challenge because we don't have a data repository, we don't have baseline data. So that is one of the challenges uh, as correctly mentioned by the previous speakers. So, uh, and other thing is that we don't have continuous research facilitated or funded uh, which is aligned with the industry requirement. There are many researches happening at the universities, but then that is not 
align with the industry requirements. So that is also uh, one of the challenges. And then at the end, as usual, financing is one of the biggest challenges. So uh, I think uh, with that, I will conclude. Uh, if you have any uh, these, uh, questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Darshani, if I may call you Darshani. Uh, yes, we have many questions and many reactions. No, thank you, really. This was very rich, uh, browsing through the projects you have, the initiatives, uh, and also um, flagging towards the end the issues of, of um, coordination. On coordination, again, one wonders if uh, tools like platforms of data sharing can be of essence, can be of, of use. Um, uh, whether constituting new platforms or having dissemination of already existing uh, platforms, like in India, there's the Incois platform, but there are others in different countries. There are some in, in Sri Lanka, of course. Uh, you've been flagging the, the, the pilot projects and the programs and your discussion with uh, donor agencies and the international community. I'm sure this will ring a bell to uh, the EFD present in the room, so I'm not entering the terrain. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let our uh, partners and colleagues react. And last but not least, you've mentioned about a national plan. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, of course, being an authority, you're entitled to do that. Uh, I will be interested in having a, a feedback later on uh, by uh, Commander Arnab Das on how institutes can feed in the national plans. This is the way it has happened in, in India. Uh, it's happened the same way in, uh, in Bangladesh, where uh, some institutes like the International uh, the, the, the Institute for, for Water Modeling are at the same time independent and close to the government. Uh, so I think that this issue of uh, having a national plan, also gathering all the actors and the stakeholders at the beginning is, is, is interesting and can be interesting in, in the context, again, of interaction with the EFD, because that is some sort of activities that uh, the research department of EFD and sometimes the operational um, divisions uh, do support or participate. So. In a nutshell, you've given us, uh, you've given us um, uh, food for thought, and, and I thank you for that, uh, Darshini. We'll, we'll get, hopefully, we'll get back to you to this. Uh, Mr. Carol Majin Mahmoud, let us, let, we'll, we'll with you conclude this first round of three discussions, which we'll try and have an interact after that. Uh, we've heard about the situation and initiatives from India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. We'll come back to India and Sri Lanka with other presenters, but uh, you are the director of the Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and of Industry. We have further on in the discussion other colleagues, uh, um, other fellow Chamber of Commerce of Industries uh, from uh, various areas, but you you're the first one to be speaking from the uh, specific angle of uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce of Industry. Uh, you have the floor on the questions of common interest of, of this panel and on uh, flagging, pitching the initiatives that um, the DACA uh, Chamber of Commerce CCI uh, may be having or launching or, or thinking about. Mr. Mahmoud, thank you so much for your trust in participating in the exercise and you have the floor. First of all, uh... As you know, the uh, verdict uh, by the International Tribunal for the Law of Disease, uh, ITLOS in Germany, held Bangladesh establishing sovereign rights to 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, in the same way, the verdict with India also allowed Bangladesh uh, sovereign right of the continental shelf extending up to 354 nautical miles. Uh, blue ocean economy represents 3.5% of global GDP. And I believe India's blue economy to GDP contribution is around 4.1%. Uh, annual 10% of China's GDP was from ocean economy. In Indonesia, about 20% of GDP. According to World Bank, Bangladesh ocean economy stands at 3.1% of the country's overall GDP. Therefore, there remains a huge potential of the ocean economy which can be utilized for taking this ratio regional and global average. Uh, as you know, Joel, that Bangladesh has 710 kilometers long coastline with an exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles inside the Bay of Bengal. 
Marine fisheries contribute 19.4% of the total fish production of the country. Besides, on an average, 81% of the international tourists visit Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, which is near the ocean and it's an ocean city. It's a tourist resort. The ocean of Bangladesh is contributing a noteworthy role to its overall socioeconomic growth through enhancing the economic activities across the country and especially to the coastal zone at Southern Perth. A new economic area for Bangladesh is demarcated in the Bay of Bengal already. Bangladesh has taken steps to flourish its blue economy in order to utilize its new marine resources since 2015. The government of Bangladesh has undertaken a number of consultations and workshops on blue economy. In addition, seven five-year plan of Bangladesh has mentioned 12 actions for maintaining a prosperous and sustainable blue economy, which include fisheries, renewable energy, human resources, transshipment, tourism, and climate change, among others. Moreover, in 2017, the Blue Economy Cell under Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh has been established with the mandate to coordinate Blue Economy Initiative across sectoral ministries. Blue economy has the prospect to contribute Bangladesh economy on a much higher level. 26 potential blue economy sectors have been identified by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Bangladesh, which include the fishery, maritime trade and shipping, energy, tourism, coastal protection, maritime safety, and surveillance for development of blue economy in Bangladesh. Bangladesh has adopted steps to ensure sustainable use of the ocean, seas, and marine resources, attaining inclusive development and goal related to sustainable development goal, SDG. Shipping, uh, mostly the Bangladesh external freight trade is seaborne, uh, which is in 2018, 90% of the total freight trade of the country. Therefore, it appears that our economy may heavily depend on freight trade in future. So to retain the huge amount of freight charges within the country, incentives might be provided to local shipping companies to add more ships to the existing fleet. Fishery is another sector. Experts opine that fish alone has 500 varieties besides snails, shellfish, crabs, sharks, octopuses, and other animals. It is estimated that Bangladesh catches only 0 0.70 million tons of fish every year out of the total 8 million tons of fish available in the Bay of Bengal. It is worthwhile to mention that 15% of the protein is provided from sea resources for the people across the world. As many people depend on ocean for their livelihood and food increase efforts and needed to save ocean resources. Oil is another sector. Bangladesh is yet to access the true potential of its offshore gas prospects. Bangladesh could also have gas fields in its area of the sea. Bangladesh process poses some gas fields in the land and like Myanmar, Bangladesh may have the potential to get more gas fields in the sea, which may add to the total reserve of gas of the country. Beside oil and gas, sea salt, ocean renewable energy, blue energy, osmosis, and biomass, aggregates, mining, sand, gravel, etc., and marine genetic resource should get more attention as ocean resources. Uh, therefore, this plenty of, there is uh, plenty of potential may contribute to our sustainable economic development in future. Tourism is another sector. Globally, coastal tourism is the largest market segment and represents 5% of world gross domestic product and contributes 6 to 7% of total employment. In 150 countries, it is one of five top export earners. Countries, least developing countries. Coastal tourism includes a beach-based recreation and tourism, tourist activities in proximity to the sea, and sea nautical boating, including yachting and marine, marinas. Sustainable tourism can create new employment opportunities and reviews poverty. Feature of exploration, exploring and exploiting these sea resources through the use of appropriate technology. The economy of Bangladesh can grow rapidly. 
Bangladesh gained a defined maritime zone in the Bay of Bengal after a long-term dispute settlement of maritime boundary with India and Myanmar. Bangladesh may pay attention in advancing its blue economy to utilize its vast sea region with sea-based resources through ensuring a sustainable balance between the protection of maritime ecosystem resources. Our country has uh, so far explored only a few number of blue economy sectors, such as fisheries and aquaculture, shipbuilding, shipbreaking, soil generation, and port facilities. Besides, most of these sectors are following traditional methods. Therefore, there still remains ample opportunities as well as challenges for exploring large number of blue economy sectors, uh, safeguarding mangrove and ocean grass, addressing environmental changes, and managing carbon discharge and introducing innovative technology for further development to contribute in achieving sustainable development goals. Another thing is, uh, one thing is very important that uh, sustainable fishing is the most important activity uh, of the ocean economy. Sustainable fishing means leaving enough fish in the ocean, respecting habitats and ensuring people who depend on fishing can maintain their livelihood. Traditional fishing must be replaced by sustainable fishing practices. In the Philippines, the Tagbanua people have traditionally employed fishing practices that simultaneously harvest and maintain fish population. Moreover, we also need to ensure that the fishermen of the country are rehabilitated during the seasons when fishing is prohibited. Uh, we lack cold chain. The cold chain system in the fishery is a temperature-dependent chain storage system. Uh, from the quality perspective, fresh seafood means that fish stock has been stored at zero centigrade, zero degree centigrade, and for frozen seafood, it means 18 degrees centigrade or colder from the sea to the consumer. The World Fisheries and Aquaculture reported that access to ice plants, cold rooms, and other infrastructure infrastructure support for cold chain is still inadequate in Bangladesh. To ensure a foreset potential, public and private sector can work in tandem for a common development of the sectors, frequent exchange of delegation, information, knowledge, and training between private sector and public sector can help capacity building of private sector. Enriching maritime resources skills as well opens up investment for private sector and tax foreign investment for tech and knowledge transfer. Joint research studies of potential avenues like ocean infrastructure, fishery, shipping and offshore energy through public-private partnership model, and national blue economy development and implementation roadmap is needed. The specifying role of private and public sector. Government can ensure regulatory support in capacity building, skills development and innovation in this sector. To meet the long-term and low-cost financing needs in blue economy scopes, capital market-led bond financing, blue bonds for the business and government agencies in ocean economy. The private sector also needs incentivized with fiscal and non-fiscal support, such as tax holidays, tax exemptions, free technological support, et cetera, to exploit desired growth. So as far as Bangladesh is concerned, Joel, we are going forward uh, with a plan, uh, but I think our private sector is the sector which need to be utilized and be financed in any manner the government can. Uh, it's, it's better that it's let, less intervention, intervention of the government, this is my personal opinion. Uh, if we strengthen our uh, blue economy, I think Bangladesh can gain a lot. And in this region also, we can have a regional committee as well. India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Myanmar, uh, possibly, uh, to strengthen and enrich and enhance our note. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you and I would like to end my pitch. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, Mr. Mahmoud. Uh, I thank you and we thank you. Uh, you've brought through many aspects. Uh, I, I can't do justice to all. 
just to personally flag two issues where there's a common resource uh, or at least a common uh, treatment. Uh, while it's the oil and gas, not presuming about the, the way the AFD engages in this sector, being of course engaged in 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 the in the matter of uh, fighting against global warming, but we all know that gas has at least a transitory role in energy transitions. Uh, the the fact that oil and gas would be exploited without pollution and also without gas flaring is something you've not mentioned if, uh, unless I missed it, but uh, it's, it's extremely important. There's a World Bank uh, uh, initiative against gas flaring and that's very important. That's something of maybe international interest. And of course, topic which has been largely debated in our group, uh, the, the common joint preservation, preservation of, of, of fishing where, um, as I was flagging, uh, prior to, to your, your discussion, uh, uh, the role of the private sector is important, is all the more important that we have large vessels, we have small fishermen, uh, small companies, uh, everyone ought to be able to contribute and have the responsibility to contribute to the preservation of the ecosystem based on their skills, based on their understanding, based on their financing. And maybe there's a way for public finance to balance that and to bring back some kind of equality of access to the this responsibility of sharing the, uh, the, 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 the responsibility of keeping the, 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 the resource. Uh, no doubt your points are important for the EFD in Bangladesh. The team is growing there. Uh, AFD has still room, I'm again speaking under the control of Jackie here mostly. The AFD has still room to define its, uh, its philosophy and approach there. Uh, I would engage you to, to keep the relationship with, with, with their office. Uh, and I thank you again for your presentation. Arnab, uh, I'm turning to you, uh, Commander Dr. Arnab Das, uh, my uh, now uh, good friend. Uh, you're heading uh, this fantastic and amazingly proactive institute in Pune, uh, and, and you're developing this concept of and the seawater uh, of deep ocean. You, you've had a chance to already present your views on the uh, and tools and, uh, and actions in our previous workshop. But here I would want you maybe to, uh, that the group can pick your brains as someone at the intersection of um, the public sector working with the private sector and as a private activity. Um, and uh, with your experience on strategic issues, because after all, that's that's the general context as well, to to maybe comment uh, briefly on the the first three presentations we've had, also to comment on the generic discussion we've had on tools, technology, and and of course, as you're a superman, super talented man, all this within a very few minutes. Um, I know uh, only you can keep this challenge uh, on. No, seriously, take your time. You have the floor. Uh, we have some other three presentations after that. We might have to extend a bit our uh, timing. I don't want to be too delayed. Um, so uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Joel. Thank you so much. Uh, it was very interesting to listen to all the presentation. I missed, I think, the one or two presentations in the second panel. But uh, uh, it is definitely, I think the problems are well known. Every speaker has alluded to most of the issues that one can talk about. But uh, what I think uh, is important is that we need to make a start. And I think you've also made a very, very important point that we need more and more people coming into the ocean domain and the water domain to kind of take this forward. So I would propose uh, probably five points quickly one is a user academy and industry partnership. Typically what happens is that we fail to get the ecosystem right. Either it is too policy heavy or it is too uh, business heavy or you know whatever. So how do we bring a user academy and industry partnership where people seamlessly collaborate and work with each other? Developing economies uh, will have a lot of difficulty in terms of you know, balancing the budget. Uh, I mean, uh, a previous speaker also mentioned that the government should do this or government should do that. But the government also has a limitation in terms of balancing. And I think 
private entities like us need to also kind of contribute in giving the policy suggestions or doing the policy advocacy and that's why uh, entities like us we are in the private sector but we have a good uh, uh, kind of collaboration or the coordination with the government we have an mou with most of the important government authorities and we are kind of complementing their efforts in taking this forward so many such entities will be required focused on specific issues to be able to do a proper justice i mean what we typically need is policy and technology intervention along with capacity building sometimes this balance is lost and you know in the long term we are not able to sustain program i mean whether you start with a pilot project or you start something big but unless that project is sustained i mean i have seen uh, uh, many institutions in india as well i mean uh, very well meaning and a good start but you know can't sustain because of certain deficiencies uh, we must also kind of keep in mind the consolidation versus diversity i mean these places are very unique i mean typically what has happened in this part of the world which is a tropical uh, littoral conditions are not very well understood and that's how you know when we try to import technologies from the west they do not work in our waters and that i think we have to when we collaborate we have to have equal partnership i mean equal partnership in the sense the participation has to be extremely equal many times i find that many organizations feel that you know say suppose i collaborate with a french entity i mean i have to have equal part, uh, participation because the french entity will not have the bandwidth to come and do things here they can give us certain support but it has to be at the local organization which has to take things forward so i think there are many aspects and i think the financing aspect has been very uh, repeatedly been brought out uh, blue bonds is something we are working on now i mean we don't expect the government to support us in every way possible we also have to have have to raise money i mean and kind of go out there and convince uh, the investment uh, uh, group to make sure that and when an investor puts money he also wants return on investment so how do we build such models which are sustainable which are not drain to the resources completely and uh, you know uh, even uh, you know uh, sustainable entrepreneurship is also something which has to generate certain returns how do we make it attractive that requires innovation and i think uh, we are happy to collaborate in whatever way possible uh, we are focused on the underwater domain awareness framework but underwater domain awareness is i think if somebody understands it well it's a huge area i mean we are not only looking at the sea but we are also looking at the uh, freshwater systems i particularly belong to assam which is very close to bangladesh so we are doing a lot of work on the brahmaputra i mean we have to have a comprehensive approach but not lose out on the diversity or the unique characteristics of the local conditions so i think i will end here uh i'm happy to collaborate with i mean the participants here or many organizations i request you to have a look at our website uh, we have uh, done a bit of work and we're happy to collaborate with everybody thank you joe yeah thank you very much uh, anab i remind everyone you're the director of the maritime research center in india in pune uh yes very very quickly uh thank you for mentioning sustainability thank you for mentioning uh, i mean of action uh sustainability versus diversity and what you mentioned about in a sense not going just through technology transfer but co-innovation uh, is not only just like in the in the in the in the air these days and uh, in fashion and etc but is absolutely essential for uh, environment ecosystem are different across latitudes that's 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 uh, that's a fact biologists and ecosystem people have known for long um, and and we've had this beginning of a conversation let me share that with you all as we're in a closed door anyway with what we call the maritime cluster in France, which gathers the key companies, the chambers of commerce and the, the technical institutes and technical companies and, and, and innovation centers. Uh, what you said, Arnab, about uh, uh, this collaboration where uh, locally uh, the capacity to scale up and the capacity to feed in uh, and adapt technologies is there uh, as organizations from France might not have the bandwidth to necessarily do that, all of them. 
uh, calls for a, a future sharing of, of work and ambitions here. Yeah. Uh, we're planning to put that into our next workshop uh, and, to, and to focus on that as well. So thank you, Anna, for your, uh, for, for, for your uh, uh, contribution. Let, let us move to the next. We're slightly delayed, but I hope it's at the benefit of a, of a good conversation and uh, of everyone wanting more exchanges after that. Let's move to the next row of, of, of speeches, uh, which are uh, on the program. It goes by Panchali Elapola, who's the project officer of the AFD Sri Lanka, and Ameya Prabhu, who's the vice president, newly elected. Congratulations, Ameya. In the Indian Chamber of Commerce, I uh, suggest if it's uh, fine with all of you and with uh, Panchali uh, in particular to uh, give the floor to Ame to uh, change the order, uh, give the floor to Ameya for two reasons. One, I would want Ameya to react also on the first three speeches and on uh, Anab Das's comment. And second, I know uh, that Ameya has a board meeting in uh, 13 minutes from now which gives him a right incentive to be short, short and crisp, as is always. So, Ameya, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Merci, Joel. And uh, I think uh, great speeches by everyone uh, prior from our friends in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and also from um, you know, various I mean, institutes uh, from Pune and, of course, Aditya in, in Orissa. I think uh, you know. I think firstly, it's a it's a, thank you, Joel, for putting this uh, uh, panel together. I think it's uh, very timely. But you know, and I think what we really need to realize is if you go to the fundamentals of the issue, that blue economy is not really a new concept. Because as long, I mean, if you see civilization has always existed next to water, be it river bodies, be it oceans, and uh, essentially humans have always benefited from. The, the ocean. So the, I mean, blue, the concept of the blue economy is actually as old as civilization itself. And I think it predates all other economies, be it the industrial economy, the coal economy, the metal economy, the bronze economy, you know, it, I mean, even before the Iron Age, the blue economy existed. But I think what we are looking for today is how do we create a sustainable blue economy? I think that is the key aspect that we need to debate on. That is the key aspect that we need to discuss on, because what is the biggest problem in today's world? Thanks to due to overfishing, we've had all sorts of issues wherein the seafood st uh, stock of the world has depleted. You know, as a seafood eater myself, you see smaller and smaller fish available now in the markets because now they are instead of waiting for the fish to mature and grow, they go and fish too early. Secondly, oil spills, excessive exploitation of uh, oil and gas, excessive exploitation of various forms of minerals from the sea has also led to tremendous damage to our oceans. And of course, the plastic menace is something which has been uh, you know, which we, I mean, I, uh, you know, more we speak about and more we talk about the better, and which is actually destroying our ocean. So I think what we really need to debate on is sustainable blue economy. And I think there were some great ideas that were made earlier. But if you ask me what I would like to focus on, and both in my business, is I'm also on the board of climate groups. So one of the things we focus on is sustainability. And, uh, you know, I'm also a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. So through that, we also push on circular economies. But if you look at it, what should be the five areas of, of what we need to focus on in blue economy? Number one is blue energy. By blue energy, what we mean is not only offshore wind, which is something which is increasingly spoken about, but also blue energy in terms of using the oceans eventually for tidal energy, using wave energy, and also look at inter-country connectivity. For example, we had our friend from Sri Lanka who spoke a lot about the blue economy, but a humongous potential between Sri Lanka and India for example, Northern Sri Lanka has very high wind resource because they get both the retreating monsoon as well as the forward monsoon and that's not been exploited. Can we do an undersea link from Sri Lanka to India and export that power to India? Because the demand is all completely in India. So wind, wave energy, ocean energy, of course, that's still more expensive, but it's expensive when you only consider the cost. The minute you start pricing in externalities that come from coal, that come from nuclear, that come from gas, suddenly it does not become very expensive. The biggest problem today in economics is we're not considering externalities. Number two, aquaculture. We, I mean, already a lot of people have spoken about aquaculture, so I will not go deeper into it. Number three is coastal and maritime tourism, something again we need to focus on. We've got phenomenal islands and Sri Lanka itself is a great place for tourism. So is Bangladesh, so is the Andaman Nicobar Islands, Myanmar, so the entire 
Bay of Bengal is phenomenal for tourism. Uh, we are also, and again, one aspect which we need to focus on is blue biotechnology. Now, what is blue biotechnology is something that a lot of people always can, you know, wonder, but the ocean gives with it a large array, for example, seaweed, the usage of seaweed, you know, and I think uh, Dr. Das can speak far better than me on this, but the usage, usage of seaweed can range from utilizing it for plant growth stimulants, something companies like Aqua Agri are doing, again, something that India, Sri Lanka and the region can work together on. Number two is seaweed can be used as carogenin which can also be replaced replacement for gummies. So increasingly veganism is growing in the world. Seaweed is a huge utilization for that. The East of the world loves eating seaweed. Again, we as South Asians can farm and sell that. That is only one aspect. Algae has humongous aspects in uh, energy, in medicine, in, you know, in, in nanotechnology. And again, we can utilize a lot of blue biotechnology in creating painkillers, utilizing a shun of algae, et cetera. The two other aspects which one can look at with the blue economy, one is on the seabed mineral resources, but I would like to check that and say that whatever mining we do on the seabed has to be sustainable, should not disturb the, and, and of course, and should not disturb the marine life. And of course, that would ensure and entail us having to increase the cost, but that cost is worth it for saving the environment. And also the other aspect of, uh, uh, is, which, which was mentioned earlier by our friend from the Dhaka Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Mahmood was on the uh, uh, oil and gas part. But again, one has to be very careful in terms of how we utilize this oil and gas. So of course, finally, I think what we need to do to ensure that the blue economy is successful, number one, and thanks to Joel, we were arranged this event is promoting a partnership approach between all members, especially in South Asia, utilizing that to further boost investment and increase uh, investment across the spectrum in this. Number three is make a joint strategy and chambers of commerce such as ourselves and various governments can play a role with institutions in, and of course institutions such as uh, the Marine Research Institute can play it in creating the strategy. And that would mean we need to do proper spatial planning of the ocean floor, proper resource planning, decide what goes where. So it needs a holistic approach rather than a, a you know, piecemeal approach. Proper maritime surveillance because I think we can work together as South Asia for proper maritime surveillance so as to reduce the cost and formally come together and you know because ultimately we might be different countries into politically but the ocean is one the ocean does not you know that same ocean touches the shores of india and i was recently had the pleasure of uh, being in dhanush kodi and you can literally see sri lanka a few miles away from there same thing with the andamans from the southernmost point indira point indonesia with ache is not too far so the ocean does not know boundaries and the ocean does not know uh, any political boundaries. So we have to work together because it's a common resource and only then can we, and I, I, I never like the word of exploiting economic resources. I would say we can harness it. And that is the right word for us to use. Again, thank you, Joel. And I look forward to engaging with your platform as we go further. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prame, uh, uh, Amiya. Uh, You've set a blueprint, it seems. You've set a roadmap. Uh, it seems we mostly have to twist it, adopt it, uh, adapt it, and, uh, and move ahead. Uh, uh, so thank you again for giving unfair competition uh, to uh, think tanks uh, from the, the chambers of commerce. No jokes apart, thank you so much, my dear friend. I think many of your uh, suggestions, analyses, and proposals are food for thought uh, for uh, for us co-organizers, not mostly the think tank, but mostly, uh, more importantly, the AFD, for the other colleagues. I keep also your idea of communicating more across the chambers of commerce. That's the only, that's only the first exercise. Uh, sure, you people don't need us to do that, but we, we would be happy to uh, and maybe with Arnab Center and other centers and uh, in three countries to coordinate with that. Um, and, and let me take this opportunity to uh, excuse here Mani Singhal from the uh, FIKI who had committed to, to, to join us but has had an unforeseeable last minute uh, issue to, to join us and is joining on, on our third workshop. Very quickly, you mentioned the seaweed. That's an important factor that connects to uh, biotechnology and bioagriculture. Uh, something that has not been mentioned into that is the 
is the adaptation uh, is the co benefits on adaptation and attenuation uh, we increasingly understand that agriculture this stands true for blue economy agriculture so for blue agriculture uh, fixes as the ability to uh, to to fix co2 um, so there, there are high co benefits here and at the period in where the world in terms of green finance or blue finance is desperately look, seeking for uh, projects for co-benefits between adaptation and 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 uh, and at and mitigation. That that's very uh, very important. Thank you for quoting the possibilities of cooperation joint projects uh, across India and Bangladesh, across India and Sri Lanka, and. We'll get back to you on that. Uh, I know we have to set you free. Uh, we'll all uh, other panelists will try and wind up within, will not try, will manage to wind up within 20 minutes. And Ameya, one last thing. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity of a, of, of a transition to uh, Panchali's presentation, who will be speaking from the side of Sri Lanka. She's based at the AFD. She'll explain the uh, type of projects which the AFD already supports in Sri Lanka. And let's see whether those you've mentioned may fit in the in the future portfolio. Uh, let's keep the, the conversation uh, going. So, uh, Mrs. Panchali Helapola, you're the project officer at the uh, AFD Sri Lanka, handling more specifically issues on the on the blue economy. Uh, project officer means there's a portfolio of, uh, of projects. We know the AFD has been quite active on those types of projects uh, in a country which is not in our focus of area of you know, regional focus today, but which is not very far. It's it's Indonesia. Uh, you have the floor to to give us a flavor of the projects which are currently developed uh, with the support of the EFD office in Sri Lanka uh, and um, those which are uh, uh, maybe under consideration or maybe some first reaction or feedbacks on what you've heard. Let me just add that uh, Mr. Reda Swergi, uh, who's the country uh, director of Sri Lanka is with us today. Uh, hi to you, Reda. Thanks for joining. And you may uh, you may uh, intervene uh, and compliment uh, or not uh, whatever uh, Panchali is saying. Panchali, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Joel, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to join you today on this very uh, interesting topic. And thank you to the other speakers who mentioned and brought up some very valid and relevant points that I think is applicable in a Sri Lankan context as well. Uh, so as Joel mentioned, I am the project officer at the Colombo Agency, and I'm currently overseeing the project preparatory work for the AFD Fishery Harbors Improvement Project. Uh, we have some others, but I specifically focused on this for today's discussion, just to keep it short and concise. So maybe Reda might be able to um, uh, uh, jump in on uh, on uh, the other uh, projects that or other studies that we have going on at the moment. So um, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the context in which uh, this project was conceptualized, and also give a, um, a brief idea of the kind of experiences and challenges that we have experienced so far in working on the blue economy topic in Sri Lanka. And perhaps maybe if time allows it, uh, there could be a broader discussion on the, uh, on the need for this inter-institutional both within, within countries and within the region uh, to have a better in institutional coordination on this, on this topic. Um, so, as uh, you might imagine, Sri Lanka being an island, uh, fisheries is a very important sector, both socially and economically. And the fisheries and seafood industry is a major export commodity for Sri Lanka. It accounts for something like 2.3% of the exports and employs around uh, 2.7 million people, both upstream and downstream on fishing related activities. Um, so, while it is a critical lifeline for many, many millions, the fishery sector um, uh, suffers from many inefficiencies and uh, issues that I think are common uh, common themes that have been discussed in both these panels. And uh, I'll just reiterate them, but they, they seem to be common uh, common across the region. But uh, some uh, some government figures estimate that there, we have very high post-harvest losses 
which is estimated something to be around 40 to 60 percent. And this is mainly attributed to the poor harbor facilities, the harbor services, the fish offloading, landing, handling, and storage practices. Um, additionally, the market conditions is very, very quantity driven rather than being quality oriented. And this directly contributes to the overexploitation of fishery resources and also the cycle of poverty, which many fisher communities uh, uh, are in. Um, and this non-discriminate fishing methods coupled with the uh, inadequate monitoring and reporting of catches um, has uh, really, make, uh, really made overfishing a long-term threat to, to the industry as a whole. So it's really in this context that uh, AFD launched a study in 2019. Uh, it was a grant to prepare a project uh, within the fishery sector that's focusing on four key harbors in the Southwest coast. And the project actually aims to promote a cleaner, greener, and more productive and sustainable mode of operation in these selected harbors. And uh, our hope is that it is, uh, they could possibly be replicated in other, harp, in other harp fishery harbors around the country in the future. Uh, so the objective is really to increase the productivity and maximize the economic benefits of these fishery resources without increasing the fishing effort. And this is a core underlying theme of the project because uh, uh, the, the sustainability of, uh, 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 the, the, of managing of the resources and the sustainability aspect is a key uh, concept that we really want to promote through this project. So the compri uh, project comprises of a mix of both hard and soft investments that are mainly focused on like uh, four thematic areas. One is to improve the harbor infrastructure by reorganizing the harbor operations to reduce these post-harvest losses and maximize, maximize the fishing output. Uh, the second is to enhance harbor management uh, 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 capacity and practices to implement more effective management and monitoring systems in the four harbors. Uh, the third is to strengthen the management of Sri Lanka's marine fishery resources by strengthening and monitoring uh, the control and surveillance uh, practices of fishery resources. And last but certainly not the le least, it's to create more integrated value chains in the sector to allow fisher communities to reap higher financial benefits and improve livelihoods. So these are the main thrusts of the projects and there are several activities and separate initiatives that are planned under these, uh, under these main components. Uh, and the scope um, is very ambitious. Um, it's, uh, it's, it will be very challenging in implementation, of course, uh, but at AFD, AFD, we strongly believe that this integrated approach is very essential to address some of the kind of underlying issues I mentioned uh, before, but also that has been discussed throughout this uh, panel. Um, one of the main challenges we have really uh, faced in preparing this uh, uh, project, and I think uh, one of the speakers from MIPA really pointed this out as well, uh, is the institutional setup in Sri Lanka. So for instance, we have four main institutional actors that are directly involved in the implementation of the project. We have the Ministry of Fishery Resources and Development. <clears throat> we have the Department of uh, Fishery and Aquatic Re uh, Resources Development. We have the Ceylon Fishery Harbor Corporation. We have the National Aquatic uh, Research uh, Resources Research Development Authority. Uh, um, we have several others like the Coast Conservation and other, other outlier uh, stakeholders as well, but those are the main four. And then to add to this, there, are, there is also the ministry and the state ministry and the various topics uh, coming under the blue, uh, blue economy umbrella are distributed amongst these uh, uh, different ministries. So the institutional setup is very challenging and uh, the reporting structures are different, uh, but yet they have very distinct and overlapping mandates as well. So the fragmentation of this institutional setup makes it very difficult to coordinate and in implement integrated projects such as this. Um, and to a certain extent, we have been successful in bringing the key actors together to the same table to kind of discuss the key uh, priorities, the key initiatives and take some important decisions. Uh, but we have continuously observed that uh, Sorry, is that echo? Okay. Um, that the different institutions will continue to work in their own silos and strictly within their mandates without consideration for the 
broader objectives. Um, I, from the project itself, I can just uh, mention that, for instance, the hub cooperation is solely focused on the infrastructure elements of the project without consideration, without consideration for how the their hub management practices and how uh, all of that is going to implement uh, is going to have an impact on the uh, the operation of the department's um, activities as a regulatory and monitoring body. So this is a real major challenge that we have uh, uh, we have observed in uh, working on such an in integrated topic. Um, and I don't I know the topic of today was to have discuss certain solutions and. Uh, uh, possible approaches, but I don't have the solutions, but I would be very interested to kind of know what the other uh, experiences regionally has been. Maybe, maybe in India, I imagine the, just the sheer size of the country and the different uh, states would make it extremely complex uh, to, uh, to work on this topic. So I would be interested to know what kind of experiences they have had. Uh, on this particular aspect, because um, just to comment on some of the other uh, discussions that had that were there, I mean, I think the whole institutional fragmentation fragmentation is a real common theme that has emerged um, uh, on this as a constraint in this topic. And I think going forward, it would be very important to kind of uh, figure out a way in which we can work within the existing framework, um, understand that. Uh, that that is the status quo for for most of our countries, um, but how we can maneuver through that and really find a way to um, introduce integrated approaches uh, for projects such as this. So I think with that, I'll just quickly stop. But I'd also like to just quickly mention uh, uh, this fisheries project is not the only initiative we have right now. Uh, the French uh, there is a um, another grant, it's not through AFD, but it's through the uh, French Economic uh, Service uh, in uh, Colombo uh, to initiate, uh, this has been done with MEPA, uh, to initiate a project to uh, launch a kind of technical, uh, uh, technical assistance on building the capacity to um, uh, the marine pollution, specifically on oil pollution. Uh, uh, to launch an initiative for that, uh, for a mapping, uh, mapping and uh, monitoring activity. Um, and I think uh, maybe Reda can just chime in on the Crimario uh, uh, yeah. intervention. Yeah, I say, well, thank you, Panchali. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, very pleased to be uh, uh, in this panel and 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 to to take stock from. Uh, or what has been said today. So I'm Radha Sorji, I'm the country director of AFD in Sri Lanka. Um, so this project, the fishery project presented by Panchali is really uh, for us a flagship project because it's fully in line with our strategy to be more active in the blue economy sector and really, um, I mean, to uh, promote a sustainable management of the natural resources, in that case, blue resources of Sri Lanka for value addition, but also uh, for, uh, uh, of course, uh, our sustainability and uh, uh, and preservation of the natural environment and resilience, also resilience to shocks, economic shocks, which we can see now, um, uh, resilience to climate change, et cetera. So I think this is a project that really shows that concretely what we can do in that. And I said, Panchali, we are, we are trying to... Uh, uh, work in the lit a little bit, I mean, going a little bit in this direction that, uh, I mean, uh, our activity in Indonesia is a good example of that be being active on really several subsectors of the blue economy, uh, including, um, I, would, I would say, uh, shipping uh, with this project that just been mentioned, I mean, uh, using uh, digital data and satellite data to fight against uh, oil discharge and salvage oil discharge at sea. State action at sea with Crimario, which is a project of using also digital data for better communication amongst vessel and uh, crisis management uh, uh, in the ocean. So that's really being active in the state action at sea. Also potentially uh, coastal uh, and maritime tourism with our subsidiary Proparco. 
uh, uh, which uh, is keen to look after uh, tourism development, but in link with uh, maritime or coastal uh, restoration uh, and protection. Um, so really, that is, uh, I would say, we are trying to develop, I would say, a broad approach of the blue economy. Um, and also, Sri Lanka is really keen to be a hub for maritime services. And we are looking with them what can I be mean, the support of an, an agency like, such as AFD in maritime services, including uh, uh, service to vessels, service to, to different maritime operators. And these are ongoing discussions. Um, and maybe a few words about, I mean, considering the whole blue economy, what we see as challenges, uh, I think it's been, I mean, the, I mean, the institutional uh, spread out and, and, and the lack of institutional coordination has been really emphasized by all actors. And I just want to notice here that um, in Indonesia, uh, AFD has been able to do very strong uh, 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 cooperation, technical and financial cooperation in the blue economy sector. Also because there is an institutional integration and you have one operator that is in charge of uh, illegal fishing, uh, harbor management, uh, sea, uh, I mean, environmental protection, et cetera, et cetera, all together. And that helped a lot. But also as other, other challenges, I would say, um, the challenge of sustainability, I mean, the use of natural resources is always challenging in, in, in terms of sustainability, uh, sustainable uses of fish resources, uh, sustainable uses of uh, coastal resources, etc., etc. It's always a challenge for us, very strong challenge on the projects. And maybe the challenge of informality, because these are sectors where you have very small actors that are uh, really, I would say, struggling for livelihood. Uh, uh, and that are co directly connected with uh, governments or very strong uh, authority. Um, and, and, and this is always difficult to, to have a multi-stakeholder approach in this context. So thank you, that was uh, my point today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Elapola, and thank you, uh, Mr. Suage, for your, for your compliments. Uh, Panchali, if I may call you uh, Panchali, the, you, you, you've been very modest saying that you don't have solutions, and, but your presentation, complemented by Reda's presentation, uh, prove that projects are part of the solution, you know, uh, with all the issues of, um, of coordination, which you've uh, aptly mentioned, with all the issues of scaling, with all the issues of going international sometimes when it's requested, which are the next step, but thank you for sharing those projects. That was very um, illustrative. That also, that gives me the opportunity to, we, we've been a few times discussing about, about a platform, let's be modest, but at least we, we, we could think of putting a drive, the Google Drive or something, uh, where we, each of you uh, from this workshop, from the previous workshop, from the group we've started constituting, who want to share something, uh, feel able to share, uh, and especially uh, if the uh, if AFD's Colombo office could be in a position to share some documents available to the public uh, uh, into this uh, this drive that would also serve as maybe ideas for uh, for others. So thank you for 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 sharing that, and uh, also thank you for giving us, us a kind of a quick uh, grasp at what your colleagues in Indonesia ha have done. Uh, we're slightly we're delayed, and that's my uh, responsibility um, as a convener. So my excuse is to all of you. We still have two speakers, not the least, uh, uh, having to excuse a third one, uh, Gigi Thompson, who's been a nearly twenty-five years long friend and then ended his career in the government as a, as a chief secretary of Kerala and who's now an independent director of the Cochin Shipyard Limited. Gigi has uh, had to back up at the last minute, despite he had been one of the early supporters of this um, meeting, uh, but he'll be there with us in the third meeting, he let me know. So uh, our last round of two speakers, Mrs. Uh, Shoma Mitro Mukherjee, trying to pronounce it uh, correctly with the uh, Bengali accent. Uh, uh, Shoma, you are the director, head of projects, uh, in the Bengal Chamber of Commerce of Industry, which needs no further presentation. And there will be Mr. Pratabi Ramarao, 
who's the group director of, of Ocean Observations Modeling and Data Simulation Group. Uh, uh, with the INCOIS. Uh, INCOIS had a chance to present us with uh, their tools already in the previous workshop, but we wanted to, uh, uh, Mr. Rao, have some more feedbacks and comments as your uh, uh, long standing, uh, uh, your, your company, our, our project now, you, you've been there since the beginning. Uh, your institute is part of the ministry and uh, we, we want to involve the ministry more in the third workshop. So, uh, Mr. Rao, will, you will give us your points, uh, feedbacks, uh, advices, maybe as a valedictory for, for ending this meeting. And before you, uh, without further ado, Shoma, uh, you have the project to present us with the projects and uh, you have the floor, sorry. Uh, to present us with the uh, projects and program the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry is having. Shoma, you have the floor. And thank you for your patience. Thank you, Joel. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, actually, Bengal Chamber of Commerce, uh, despite, a, despite being a Chamber of Commerce, we have a separate uh, a research division. So uh, this research division does various kind of projects. Uh, our projects are focused mainly on you know, primary research, secondary research, data analysis, and doing various models. And the other very important role we play is that you know, uh, bringing private investment, private finance into various sectors. Currently, we are bringing a private, you know, we are working for a project which aims to bring private finance in waterways, waterways transportation that we are currently doing with World Bank. So uh, like as we have a very uh, strong primary and secondary research team, from Bengal perspective, one thing I can, you know, I can add to uh, to the research work, to your research work that, you know, in Bengal, there are uh, about 80,000 fish farming families. And we have, uh, you know, conducted various work among those fish farming families. Uh, while doing that, you know, we mainly worked for, you know, the sustainability related issues. When we talk about sustainability in the business, a very most important stakeholder of the whole, you know, system of the whole ecosystem, each, uh, ecosystem is the fish farmers, you know, themselves. But if you go to them, you know, we are talking here about, you know, over uh, overfishing. We are talking about, you know, marine pollution, especially fuel pollution. We are talking about. Uh, but you know, you know, at the very bottom level, you know, the awareness generation is really, really poor. At, as far as we have worked, but you know, while we work for the donor agencies, it is we understand to address this problem. It is very important to you know uh, to write a financial model and to take initiatives to bring private investment in the blue economy in this sector. Definitely, there are some players who are the members of the chamber. We are working out with them. I'm not taking the name right now, but there are in Bengal, there are definitely uh, quite a large number of players, those who you know work in blue economy. But still, I feel connecting the peace, fish farmers at the very grassroots level is very, very important. And, you know, again, I'm saying that the financial model, you know, drawing up the financial model is very important. That would I like to, and obviously we are very interested to work at that level. Thank you, Joel. No, thank you very much, Shoma. That's, ve that's very clear, uh, very uh, quick uh, and efficient. And you're pointing a, an area which was a blind area, blind angle for us, 
uh, I think it would be very important to maybe uh, an even more kind of closed door event to start discussing and exchanging on uh, not whom exactly, but you know, on this thinking and 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 uh, of some of your members that you're having about the regulation and you know on what are the different lines which are discussed. We have, we're happy with that, and maybe some other members of our group would be. Uh, that's one and two. Uh, maybe we should think back with our uh, partners and colleagues at AFD. Uh, whether in different parts of the world, in this sector or in other sectors, there have been ways and means to gather such a large group of people uh, who share the same resource. We also, as I was saying before, uh, have to share the resource with much bigger actors, you know, and how there's a way to coordinate them and help them coordinate with uh, the resource, you know. So uh, if it is, if there are experiences like that in this sector, that's the best even if there's no there are no much uh, experiences in this sector maybe to have you know this type of coordination maybe among farmers or you know might be a way to also to think forward in terms of of research but but maybe here's the researcher who speaks and not so much the convener of the meeting so i should stop there and and thank you again uh, very much shoma um dr raho you have um the floor for uh, for the very difficult position, which is uh, not the concluding part, but the, not the wrapping up part, but you come at after a wave, after a tsunami of uh, many, many contributions. You also deserve uh, the highest level of my excuses for giving you the floor so late. Um, so you have it all. Yeah, uh, thanks, Joel. I would like to make a brief presentation on uh, data and information, which was uh, uh, raised. Uh, the issue was raised by the previous speakers. Uh, my apologies if it is uh, uh, going to be a repeat uh, uh, from the previous uh, session, uh, but I would like to highlight some of the tools and technologies that we have developed. Uh, uh, with your permission, I would like to upload uh, my presentation. I think you have the authorization to share uh, your screen, yes. Yes. Can you see? We can. Yeah. Uh, you all know that you know, all the, uh, my previous speakers, you know, they've talked about the issues with regard to the data, you know, the data availability, accuracy, and transparency. And also, some of the speakers raised about the, 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 the climate uh, modeling, in particular the regional climate model and as well as the, the regional cooperation. Uh, in my uh, brief talk, I would like to address some of these issues uh, uh, and also uh, demonstrate some of the tools that we have developed now to provide uh, uh, ocean data and information, which is a key element of uh, a blue economy. Uh, 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 myself, I'm uh, uh, Patabi Ramara. I'm the group director at Indian National Center for uh, Ocean Information and Advisory Services, and I am responsible for uh, implementation of ocean observations, as well as uh, modeling and uh, uh, data assimilation activities at NCOIS. So ocean observation and uh, in ocean observations, information and advisory services uh, play a critical role in uh, securing lives and livelihoods of uh, uh, communities and also in achieving the goals envisaged in the blue economy framework, as well as a sustainable development goal that is 14 life uh, under the water and also the United Nations uh, decade of ocean science for sustainable uh, development. So the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services has the mandate to provide ocean observation information and advisory services. So the services that uh, we provide uh, are uh, of different nature. One is the ecosystem services where we provide the potential fishing zone advisory services to the fishing community. Now we are also giving the species specific focus and we another service provided by INCAIS is uh, coral bleaching alert and uh, harmful algal bloom uh, uh, services. And now we are also starting the coastal water quality advisory services mainly to support this uh, coastal tourism. And we have uh, uh, ocean state forecast services, you know, which uh, actually supports the safe navigation and safe operations at the sea, where we use the suit of models and generate uh, daily forecast of uh, sea conditions for the next uh, five to seven days. And we also provide the disaster related warning services like tsunamis, storm surge, high waves, 
and also previous speakers they have mentioned uh, oil spill uh, related things so we also provide the oil spill track advisory services using the the models as well as the uh, uh, data that is coming from in situ observations as well as uh, remote sensing so now we are embarking on uh, providing ocean climate change advisory services which we have initiated this year as part of the deep ocean mission implemented by government of india so we are going to develop uh, 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 future projections of the sea level change uh, where we are going to work on regional uh, models and in particular we would like to provide these advisory services at the regional level in particular for india but when uh, we are covering this bay of bengal and arabian sea will be covering uh, the, the the countries that are present here sri lanka and bangladesh also uh, other important service where uh, uh, blue economy is concerned no very important is marine spatial planning so we also uh, work on the coastal geospatial services like you now we develop the coastal vulnerability indices multi hazard vulnerability mappings and 3d gis three dimensional geographical information system particularly for some of the highly vulnerable coastal areas you now which are uh, having uh, which are uh, vulnerable to tsunamis and storm surges uh, where we can uh, uh, use these maps for estimation of inundation and also risk assessment so another important service uh, uh, we provide is the data web based services and other thing when it comes to the regional cooperation uh, we have uh, established the international training center for operational oceanography uh, 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 which has been designated as the category 2 center by ioc unesco where we are uh, uh, providing training to indian ocean rim countries in all the uh, areas which i have uh, mentioned uh, uh, earlier uh, and so far we have uh, uh trained about 400 4250 uh, uh professionals from 75 uh, uh, ioc member states and we have all the national infrastructure network in terms of uh, observations both in situ and remote sensing we do have the satellite oceanography and also ocean science and modeling uh and the stakeholders include uh, right from fishing community uh, uh coastal states med departments and strategic uh, like defense navy and uh, uh, national hydrographic office and coast guards we do have uh, 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 routine uh, uh, services uh, for ports and harbors and also we work uh, customized services for ports and harbors and as well as now uh, oil and glass platforms also and we do work with research institutions and uh, academia uh, in uh, uh, improving our services uh, and to provide these services uh, india has established the ocean observing network on the left hand side top uh, panel you can see that the the ocean observing network that is being implemented by uh, incois jointly with uh, various national institutions we have a wide variety of ocean observing network providing different parameters from the ocean and also is complemented by uh, uh, remote sensing observations of indian as well as uh, foreign satellites uh, as you all know that you know the indian ocean is uh, so very important it has uh, a very critical uh, 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 geographical feature uh, and uh, many countries are uh, interested in uh, Uh, uh observing this ocean uh, to uh, find uh, uh, various oceanographic process uh, uh, and understanding this process and its impact on the various uh, 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 weather and climate uh, 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 processes so many other countries also we uh, uh, deployed this ocean observing system in the indian ocean and uh, as a uh, as a center in, uh, we also receive data from all these observing network that are deployed by various other countries and also we are part of various international uh, programs when it comes to uh, uh, the data uh, actually incois has been designated as the central repository for the oceanographic uh, data in the country by the ministry of earth sciences and we also have been designated as the national oceanographic data center by ioc unesco uh, we have the responsibility to uh, receive this data in real time uh, uh, process it quality control it and then disseminate it in real, real time most of the observing systems we receive in real time and then after the real time quality control checks we provide it to the operational agencies in real time and also we do the uh, uh, quality control checks so we are part of international data management teams as well as the scientific steering teams of these uh, uh, international uh, ocean observing uh, platforms where we ensure the quality and accuracy of these data so we also host a different international uh, uh, data centers so as part of our uh, uh, data management activities uh, to provide this data to users wide spectrum of users we have developed uh, a digital ocean which is an innovative web application to manage and visualize the data in multidisciplinary way and also it provides uh, the user to uh, visualize the data in multidimensional view can uh, have 
two dimensional three dimensional or at the fourth dimensional or at uh, uh, time with uh, which becomes the multi dimensional so these tools are available for the users you know uh, uh, for effective utilization of these data for their research and also we have developed some of the scientific tools which a common user cannot uh, analyze this data uh, the tools are in built into this digital ocean so this is one very important uh, 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 tool which we have developed uh, uh, using this information and communication technology advancements so another important initiative when we talk about the oceans no uh, uh, the ministry of earth sciences also deals with uh, uh, a variety of projects no through its uh, institutions uh, relating to atmosphere ocean polar sciences and geosciences we have also developed the s system science data portal where we are trying to integrate all these data from all these disciplines into a single platforms and provide the metadata and the user will be diverted to uh, uh, different uh, themes like uh, uh, when we are talking about the blue economy uh, the data which incas force is most the physical but when it comes to the coastal or marine marine living resources uh, our other sister concerns like uh, national center for coastal research uh, uh, which does the coastal uh, uh, area uh, coastal zone man management and also center for marine living resources and ecology where we have this uh, uh, data on the marine living resources so this particular data uh, the website will uh, provide the metadata on the data collected uh, uh, by various institutes that are involved in uh, ocean as well as uh, the coastal related things so user can get this data uh, on uh, various aspects of uh, uh, various aspects under the earth system science so in addition to that one uh, this uh, in addition to the data inca is also as uh, by leveraging this information and communication technologies has developed by, developed the state of the art uh, website to provide the ocean information and advisory services which i have mentioned in my uh, previous uh, slide so all these services are available readily available at uh, uh, fingertips of the user so now coming to the uh, uh, the blue economy we know that you know there is a ocean of data and uh, several institutions uh, in india as well as in the region know that uh, they generate uh, so much of data uh, uh, which has got multidisciplinary which is uh, relevant to key areas of the blue economy Uh, when i talk about uh, other key areas of the blue economy like you now we are talking about the fisheries and uh, 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 and other uh, things but uh, we also talked about the blue energy uh, uh, but whatever we uh, the initiative we consider under the blue economy it needs the data so many of these agencies uh, uh, in india uh, uh, from other ministries you know they develop uh, data uh, of uh, uh, key areas of blue economy like uh, sustainable uh, use of living resources uh, where we have uh, some of the institutions mineral and energy resources uh, deep ocean technology for harnessing resources shipping and ports and we have the uh, uh, early warnings for ocean hygienic disasters both in case and imd provides and coastal zone management and maritime uh, special planning coastal tourism survey and mapping so there are several institutions under several ministries you know they generate a huge amount of data when you talk about the blue economy it is very important that we need to have a national framework Uh, to integrate all these environmental societal and economic data from all these uh, stakeholders uh, to stimulate this blue economy and we have we also have to leverage information and com communication technology uh, for effectively and efficiently using this data for decision making and uh, policy matters so i think with this uh, few uh, uh, things now i would like to conclude my presentation any questions please thank you very much Thank you Dr Dr Rao always good to know that in this uh, difficult uh, problems where we have to navigate we have uh, we have tools to help us navigate uh, <clears throat> when river to you uh, as i was saying uh, it would be good to consider how we can share uh, a, a few aspects uh, then i understand that some of your tools are um, on your platform already no need to duplicate that and are uh, you know restrict, restricted to your users or that you have a user system which is perfectly fair and understandable but <clears throat> whatever you want be in a position to to share to also widespread make the the information more widespread and possibly intrigue new users uh, is of essence <clears throat> these are some tools we could discuss again in the next workshop uh, with as i was saying the maritime cluster in france might be interested i mean we we'll have some follow ups on that 
rather than questions now uh, being already uh, uh, late. <clears throat> uh, we are quite delayed, so I don't know if anyone has pressing points, questions. Arnab, do you have a few points to make or not? If you feel free, um, or anyone. And after that, I'll give the floor for concluding, concluding words or takeaway words. Uh, to Ellen uh, Jufelkit first, um, and then to uh, Jackie and Pro uh, second. Thank you, Joel. Uh, very quick point. I think uh, the presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Rao was extremely uh, insightful, and I think there's a lot of work going on by organizations like INCOIS and some other government agencies in India. But the requirement is so large that I think we need many organizations outside of these organizations who can complement what uh, these organizations are providing and which can reach out to the communities or to the stakeholders and various users of this data and make it more customized to what they require. Otherwise, so much effort is not able to reach to the ground level. So I think there is a requirement for many organizations to come forward and contribute. And as we use the data more, I think there will be far more, uh, you know, uh, aspects that we will understand and far more, you know, quality enhancement will also happen. That's Thank you I very think. much, uh, Arnab and uh, on, on, on uh, oh yeah, I, on a small, uh, on a note of, uh, I've noticed Mr. Dash wants to intervene. Uh, just to, to, to thank you, Arnab, uh, and on the note of uh, humor, uh, I share with you uh, the fact that various organizations are needed, provided the complementarities ensured, you know, it's always the, 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 the and the sustainability paradox, which is what you earmarked yourself, but but on a note of humor, I'm happy to see that uh, your message on uh, let's 100 uh, flowers bloom uh, allows the Maoist in me and the uh, former commander uh, in you uh, to meet on this uh, on, on this uh, on this ID. Mr. Dash, you had uh, you 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 had a comment or wanted to? Yes, Joel. Uh, just wanted to ask uh, because MPDA would really be interested, even for a you know uh, a project that would come uh, include Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and if possible Myanmar. So all of we have Bengal included. And not only do we work with smallholder farmers, uh, that NAXA initiative that I've told you about, we also have another initiative called Netfish, where we work with smallholder wild, caught, uh, wild catch fishermen and trawler operators. And we also have our uh, Aquaculture Research Institute, which is the Rajiv Gandhi Center for Aquaculture. So really looking forward to the Google documents you mentioned that will be set up after this workshop. You know, yes. and probably Take it from there. Thank you, thank you, Aditya. Again, with uh, first of all, with a with a pinch of humor for thank you for reminding us with geography and that Myanmar is definitely in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, that's good to be back to geography. That's uh, something. Uh, and on a more serious, but yeah, well, it's important, serious as well. And on an even more serious note. Uh, well, thank you for your intervention and and for our names one because. This was the aim of this workshop, uh, which is the first way to acquaintain uh, ourselves to, to, to start having at least the feeling, the mood, the willingness and some proposals to explore something across borders, to explore something across organizations. And the, 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 the very last presentations and interventions have uh, gelled with this. I'm very happy if we could contribute with that and if this, if this seed uh, can grow. Now, for this seed to grow, uh, I'm not the most legitimate. Uh, uh, the AFD is, uh, along with you people. So I'm happy to hand over the floor for concluding words to uh, Ellen first. Uh, Ellen, who's the director in charge of research, <clears throat> and research uh, has been mentioned, in, including in your previous uh, comments, and then to Jackie Ampru, who's the head of uh, the projects division for the whole of South Asia. And uh, uh, Jackie will also tell us where uh, this geography of South Asia within the AFD ends. 
uh, and and I'm sure he he as well as uh, Helen have many uh, feedbacks takeaways already from your um, from your participation. I know we're very late, but I thank all of you to have stayed till this point uh, for this very important moment where we. Uh, don't just wrap up, but uh, plant seeds for the future. Ellen, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Royal, and thank you to every speaker. Really, I, I am impressed by all the expertise uh, I've heard today. So I'm quite reassured that the research is ongoing and I had no doubt on, on that. So we had a big demonstration of both of the expertise at the research level, but uh, as well at the administration level, because um, at all stage, the, 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 the expertise is there. My takeaway, if, if I understood it quite uh, quietly, is that uh, the research has to, to be more plugged to two um, tracks. First, it responds to the demand of the private sector and to the industry. It has been mentioned, so I think we need to further dig in what are really the missing links uh, uh, on this demand? Of course, we have a lot of research done on academic, on the on the on the physical side, on the impacts, and it's very um, uh, specialized by sector. It's very micro, but we need to address maybe a little a bit more what are the, the interests on a more macro level for the private sector. The second track is really to plug uh, the research to the uh, deciders uh, at the political level, at the, at the national, at the, the one who are taking decisions, who are taking bu budgetary decisions, reform decisions. So I think we need to, 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 to dig in further how to, 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 to leverage this uh, and disseminate. And, and it, has been, uh, it, it has been told many times that it has to be used, uh, this, uh, this feature. So I don't have the solution, but you have addressed a, a lot of, uh, you know, um, lines to, to that. And uh, what I've heard is that tools are really important. And I, I, I agree with that at the EFD, at the research department. Uh, all research has to be uh, uh, disseminated through uh, common tools to be used by the community. And uh, at, at this stage, I think uh, I, I concur with what has been said at the end, especially by uh, Mr. Rao, that uh, we need, and, and but others as well, the, the, the blue economy and the ocean economy is, of course, uh, linked to resources, but as well to environment and to economic and social. So I think we need to have all this uh, topic in a whole, and uh, we, we should maybe go through the, the, the reflection towards a, a, a model, uh, including all these aspects. So uh, I don't know whether such a model uh, uh, exists. I'm sure that uh, there is uh, somehow uh, this kind of model that could gather, you know, a lot of stakeholders uh, and uh, simulating using all the data, uh, because a lot of data are existing, uh, to um, uh, to simulate uh, in the long run and not only in the short run what could be the different impacts in the in the environmental social and economic aspects uh, the AFD is um, providing a lot of research on, on this more on a transition uh, uh, in climate change uh, in, in in energy but I think it would be an interesting uh, uh, way forward to think about the ocean uh, modernization in in a, complex and uh, macroeconomic and financial uh, model. Um, and uh, finally, um, we, we, we need to build community. And uh, I think we are doing that right now. The, the, the platform ID would be a very uh, nice ID, not only at the national level, but as a, at the regional, because uh, the ocean is a common. And uh, yes, we have tools to put together some uh, community. Uh, we have a common approach. I mean, uh, uh, but we need to, to, to identify who are the actors and uh, to, to, to make it, to make it lively. Uh, it's uh, it's really a dialogue issue, and I think that uh, thanks uh, Joel uh, for uh, coordinating this webinar because because we are we are building the the the, the, the first bricks of this kind of uh, community to be to be pursued. Uh, thank you very much. Your, your thanks, uh, 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 rejoicing, uh, rejoicing, and uh, but they go to the team and they go also to all the, the past participants and uh, who've been with us so, all throughout. Thank you, but thank you, Olen. Jackie, you have the final words and um, uh, the seeds of the future are in your hands. 
<laughs> that's quite impressive. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Joel. And uh, I'm joining Hélène, of course, in uh, in thanking all the speakers for for this very stimulating discussion. And uh, I think we really appreciate it to 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 have uh, different actors uh, brought together for that discussion, uh, researchers, uh, also the economic uh, actors, and and AFD with. Uh, uh, trying to to put together some solutions combined with some financing to to promote what has been uh, mentioned as our common goal, which is uh, developing and promoting a sustainable management of marine fisheries. So, of course, um, uh, uh, if I refer to the to the private sector uh, position and and vision, and that was uh, mentioned several times by um, uh, the speakers representing um, uh, chambers of commerce, um, the the uh, the ma sustainable management of marine resources needs to be combined with uh, acceptable rates of returns, which is when. We come to business uh, is is a, a, a precondition to attract um, uh, private funding, and AFD uh, is very much aware of that. And the AFD is trying to to play this uh, catalytic role to the, which brings together um, other investors. And the AFD doesn't pretend to have the solution and to to finance uh, all the needs, but uh, is willing to to create this networking and to create these communities to. Uh, to, to, to work all together on, on solutions. And uh, I think that was very much uh, explored during that, that discussion. And we, we need to, um, to continue uh, working together. Uh, the, the different experiences that were presented by uh, our uh, Colombo team also shows the challenges. And one of the challenge is to bring together uh, at the same table all the actors of the sectors to design a project. And that is a heavy role for, for AFD. And it's it's not so easy, but it's it's really a key condition for, for, for success. And what we are trying, so we are doing it domestically at national level, but now what we are really willing to do, and I, I mentioned it uh, during the introduction, and it was also reminded by, um, by Hélène, we want to develop the same um, uh, common vision and same common approach at regional level. And I, I, I heard the, the representative of the Chamber of Commerce who was proposing to have a regional community of Chambers of Commerce. And that is something that we would uh, love to work on. And same thing for, for researchers, how we can make sure that uh, data and research available at national level can be uh, shared and uh, be made, avail make it made available to, uh, to, regional, um, to regional entities. So um, again, thank you to you, um, uh, Joel, for, for mod moderating this uh, uh, this discussion to all the speakers. Um, uh, I think it was quite, I mean, for me, it was quite unique as a, the type of discussion we had together with uh, the variety of uh, diversity of, of speakers. And uh, we see that we are all sharing the same, uh, the same uh, general objective of uh, uh, promoting sustainable management of marine resources. And we need to work together. Thank you to you and to your team, of course, because I know uh, there is a lot of work behind the scene and uh, uh, especially Mallory and, uh, and uh, all your team. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Mallory, uh, Jacqueline, who's been uh, helping us, even though she's uh, on holidays in uh, Australia, who's been uh, phoning actively. Rokaya, who's been at the... Uh, uh, la technique, as we say, on the technological side, uh, as we, we also thank you for, for the trust. Next step is uh, coming soon uh, to a date we need to still discuss. We'll get back to each of you. Have a wonderful end of the week and a great weekend and stay safe and away from this uh, COVID, whichever uh, variants uh, is there. And thank you to everyone.